Nonsense Stories from the Book of Stories, Botany and Alphabets by Edward Lear. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of the Four Little Children Who Went Round the World Once upon a time, a long while ago, there were four little people whose names were Violet, Slingsby, Guy and Lionel and they all thought they should like to see the world, so they bought a large boat to sail quite round the world by sea, and then they were to come back on the other side by land. The boat was painted blue with green spots, and the sail was yellow with red stripes, and when they set off they could only took a small cat to steer and look after the boat, besides an aged elderly quangle-wangle who had to cook the dinner and make the tea, for which purposes they took a large kettle. For the first ten days they sailed on beautifully, and found plenty to eat, as there were lots of fish, and they had only to take them out of the sea with a long spoon, when the quangle-wangle instantly cooked them, and the pussy-cat was fed with the bones, with which she expressed herself pleased on the whole, so that all the party were very happy. During the daytime Violet chiefly occupied herself in putting salt water into the churn, while her three brothers churned it violently in the hope that it would turn into butter, which it seldom, if ever, did, and in the evening they all retired into the tea-kettle, where they all managed to sleep very comfortably while Pussy and the Quangle-Wangle managed the boat. After a time they saw some land at a distance, and when they came to it they found it was an island made of water quite surrounded by earth. Beside that it was bordered by evanescent isthmus, with a great gulf stream running all over it, so that it was perfectly beautiful, and contained only a single tree, five hundred and three feet high. When they had landed, they walked about, but found to their great surprise that the island was quite full of veal cutlets and chocolate drops and nothing else. So they all climbed up to the single high tree to discover, if possible, if there were any people. But having remained on the top of the tree for a week, and not seeing anybody, they naturally concluded that there were no inhabitants, and accordingly when they came down they loaded the boat with two thousand veal cutlets and a million of chocolate drops, and these afforded them sustenance for more than a month, during which time they pursued their voyage with utmost delight and apathy. After this they came to a shore where there were no less than sixty-five great red parrots with blue tails, sitting on a rail all of a row and all fast asleep and I am sorry to say that the pussycat and the quangle-wangle crept softly, and bit off the tail-feathers of all the sixty-five parrots, for which Violet reproved them both severely. Notwithstanding which, she proceeded to insert all the feathers, two hundred and sixty in number, in her bonnet, thereby causing it to have a lovely and glittering appearance, highly prepossessing and efficacious. The next thing that happened to them was in a narrow part of the sea, which was so entirely full of fishes that the boat could go no farther. So they remained there about six weeks, till they had eaten nearly all the fishes, which were soles, and already cooked and covered with shrimp sauce, so there was no trouble whatever. And as the few fishes who remained uneaten complained of the cold, as well of the difficulty they had in getting any sleep on account of the extreme noise made by the arctic bears and the tropical turnspits, which frequented the neighbourhood in great numbers, Violet most amiably knitted a small woollen frock for several of the fishes, and Slingsby administered some opium drops to them, through which kindness they became quite warm and slept soundly. Then they came to a country which was wholly covered with immense orange trees of a vast size and quite full of fruit, so they all landed, taking with them the tea-kettle, intending to gather some of the oranges, and place them in it. But, while they were busy about this, a most dreadfully high wind rose, and blew out most of the parrot tail-feathers from Violet's bonnet. That, however, was nothing compared with the calamity of the oranges falling down on their heads by millions and millions, which thumped and bumped and bumped and thumped them all so seriously that they were obliged to run as hard as they could for their lives. Besides that, the sound of the oranges rattling on the tea-kettle was of the most fearful and amazing nature. Nevertheless, they got safely to the boat, although considerably vexed and hurt, and the quangle-wangle's right foot was so knocked about that he had to sit with his head in his slipper for at least a week. 
This event made them all for a time rather melancholy, and perhaps they might never have become less so, had not Lionel, with a most praiseworthy devotion and perseverance, continued to stand on one leg, and whistle to them in a loud and lively manner, which diverted the whole party so extremely that they gradually recovered their spirits, and agreed that whenever they should reach home, they would subscribe towards a testimonial to Lionel, entirely made of gingerbread and raspberries, as an earnest token of their sincere and grateful affection. After sailing on calmly for several more days, they came to another country, where they were much pleased and surprised to see a countless multitude of white mice with red eyes, all sitting in a great circle, slowly eating custard pudding, with the most satisfactory and polite demeanour. And as the four travellers were rather hungry, being tired of eating nothing but soles and oranges for so long a period, they held a council as to the propriety of, of asking the mice for some of their pudding in a humble and affecting manner, by which they could hardly be otherwise than gratified. It was agreed, therefore, that Guy should go and ask the mice, which he immediately did, and the result was that they gave a walnut shell, only half full of custard diluted with water. Now this displeased Guy, who said, Out of such a lot of pudding as you have got, I must say, you must have spared a somewhat larger quantity. But no sooner that he had finished speaking than the mice turned round at once, and sneezed at him in an appalling and vindictive manner and it is impossible to imagine a more scrubious, unpleasant sound than that caused by the simultaneous sneezing of many millions of angry mice. So that Guy rushed back to the boat, having first shied his cap in the middle of the custard pudding, by which means he completely spoiled the mice's dinner. By and by the four children came to a country where there were no houses, but only an incredibly innumerable number of large bottles without corks, and of a dazzling and sweet susceptible blue colour. Each of these blue bottles contained a blue bottle fly, and all these interesting animals live continually in the most copious and rural harmony, nor perhaps in many parts of the world is such perfect and abject happiness to be found. Violet and Slingsby and Guy and Lionel were greatly struck with this singular and instructive settlement, and, having previously asked permission of the blue bottle flies, which was most courteously granted, the boat was drawn up to the shore, and they proceeded to make tea in front of the bottles, but as they had no tea leaves, they merely placed some pebbles in the hot water, and the quangle wankle played some tunes over it on an accordion, by which, of course, tea was made directly, and of the very best quality. The four children then entered into conversation with the blue bottle flies, who discoursed in a placid and genteel manner, though with a slightly buzzing accent, chiefly owing to the fact that they each held a small clothes brush between their teeth, which naturally occasioned a fizzy extraneous utterance. "'Why,' said Violet, "'would you kindly inform us do you reside in bottles, and, if in bottles at all, why not rather in green or purple, or indeed in yellow bottles?' To which questions a very aged blue bottle fly answered, "'We found the bottles here all ready to live in, that is to say, our great-great-great-great-great-grandfathers did. So we occupied them at once.' and when the winter comes on we turn the bottles upside down, and consequently rarely feel the cold at all, and you know very well that this could not be the case with bottles of any other colour than blue. Of course it could not, said Slingsby, but if we may take the liberty of inquiring, on what do you chiefly subsist? Mainly on oyster patties, said the blue bottle fly, and when these are scarce, on raspberry vinegar and Russian leather boiled down to a jelly. How delicious, said Guy. To which Lionel added, Huzz, and all the blue bottle flies said, Buzz. At this time, an elderly fly said it was the hour for the evening song to be sung, and, on a signal being given, all the blue bottle flies began to buzz at once in a sumptuous and sonorous manner, the melodious and mochilaginous sounds echoing all over the waters, and resounding across the tumultuous tops of the transitory titmice upon the intervening and verdant mountains with a serene and sickly suavity only known to the truly virtuous. The moon was shining slobaciously from the stars bespangled sky, while her light irrigated the smooth and shiny sides and wings and backs of the blue bottle flies with a peculiar and trivial splendour, while all nature cheerfully responded to the cerulean and conspicuous circumstances. 
In many long after years, the four little travellers looked back to that evening as one of the happiest in all their lives, and it was already past midnight, when, the sail of the boat having been set up by the Quangle Wangle, the tea kettle and churn placed in their respective positions, and the pussy cat stationed at the helm, the children each took a last and affectionate farewell of the blue bottle flies, who walked down in a body to the water's edge to see the travellers embark. As a token of parting respect and esteem, Violet made a curtsy quite down to the ground, and stuck one of her few remaining parrot tail feathers into the back hair of the most pleasing of the blue bottle flies, while Slingsby, Guy and Lionel offered them three small boxes containing, respectively, black pins, dried figs and Epsom salts, and thus they left that happy shore for ever. Overcome by their feelings, the four little travellers instantly jumped into the tea kettle and fell fast asleep. But all along the shore for many hours there was a distinctively heard a sound of severely suppressed sobs, and a vague multitude of living creatures using their pocket handkerchiefs in a subdued simultaneous snuffle, lingering sadly along the walloping waves as the boat sailed further and further away from the land of happy bluebottle flies. Nothing particular occurred for some days after these events, except that, as the travellers were passing a low tract of sand, they perceived an unusual and gratifying spectacle namely a large number of crabs and crawfish, perhaps six or seven hundred sitting by the waterside, and endeavouring to disentangle a vast heap of pale pink worsted, which they moistened at intervals with a fluid composed of lavender water and white wine negus. "'Can we be of any service to you, O crusty crabbies?' said the four children. "'Thank you kindly,' said the crabs consecutively. "'We are trying to make some worsted mittens, but we do not know how.' on which Violet, who was perfectly acquainted with the art of mitten-making, said to the crabs, "'Do your claws unscrew, or are they fixtures?' "'They are all made to unscrew,' said the crabs, and forthwith they deposited a great pile of claws close to the boat, with which Violet uncombed all the pale pink worsted, and then made the loveliest mittens with it you can imagine. These, the crabs, having resumed and screwed on their claws, placed cheerfully upon their wrists, and walked away rapidly on their hind legs, warbling songs with a silvery voice in a, and in a minor key. After this the four little people sailed on again, till they came to a vast and wide plain of astonishing dimensions, on which nothing whatever could be discovered at first. But, as the travellers walked onward, there appeared in the extreme and dim distance a single object, which on a nearer approach, and on an accurately cutaneous inspection, seemed to be somebody in a large white wig, sitting on an armchair made of sponge-cakes and oyster-shells. "'It does not quite look like a human being,' said Violet doubtfully. Nor could they make out what it really was, till the quangle-wangle, who had previously been round the world, exclaimed softly in a loud voice, "'It is the cooperative cauliflower!' And so in truth it was, and they soon found that what they had taken for an immense wig was in reality the top of the cauliflower, and that he had no feet at all, being able to walk tolerably well with a fluctuating and graceful movement on a single cabbage stalk, an accomplishment which naturally saved him from the expense of stockings and shoes. Presently, while the whole party from the boat was gazing at him with mingled affection and disgust, he suddenly arose, and in a somewhat plumdumphious manner, hurried off towards the setting sun, his steps supported by two superincumbent confidential cucumbers, and a large number of water wagtails proceeding in advance of him by three and three in a row, till he finally disappeared on the brink of the western sky in a crystal cloud of pseudorific sand. So remarkable a sight, of course, impressed the four children very deeply, and they returned immediately to their boat with a strong sense of underdeveloped asthma and a great appetite. Shortly after this, the travellers were obliged to sail directly below some high overhanging rocks, from the top of one of which a peculiarly odious little boy, dressed in rose-coloured knickerbockers and with a pewter plate upon his head, threw an enormous pumpkin at the boat, by which it was instantly upset. But this upsetting was of no consequence, because all the party knew how to swim very well, and in fact they preferred swimming about till after the moon rose, when, the water growing chilly, they spongetaciously entered the boat. Meanwhile the quangle-wangle threw back the pumpkin with immense force, so that it hit the rocks where the malicious little boy in rose-coloured knickerbockers was sitting, when, 
being quite full of lucifer matches, the pumpkin exploded surreptitiously into a thousand bits, whereon the rock instantly took fire, and the odious little boy became unpleasantly hotter and hotter and hotter, till his knickerbockers were turned quite green and his nose was burnt off. Two or three days after this happened, they came to another place, where they found nothing at all except some wide and deep pits full of mulberry jam. This is the property of the tiny yellow-nosed apes, who abound in these districts, and who store up the mulberry jam for their food in winter, when they mix it with pellucid pale periwinkle soup and serve it in wedgewood china bowls, which grow freely all over that part of the country. Only one of the yellow-nosed apes was on the spot, and he was fast asleep, yet the four travellers and the quangle-wangle and pussy were so terrified by the violence and sanguinary sound of his snoring, that they merely took a small cupful of the jam, and returned to re-embark in the boat without delay. What was their horror on seeing the boat, including the churn and the tea-kettle, in the mouth of the enormous sea-spider, an aquatic and ferocious creature truly dreadful to behold, and happily only met with in those excessive longitudes? In a moment the beautiful boat was bitten into fifty-five thousand million hundred billion bits, and it instantly became quite clear that violent Slingsby, Guy and Lionel, could no longer preliminate their voyage by sea. The four travellers were therefore obliged to resolve on pursuing their wanderings by land, and, very fortunately, there happened to pass by at that moment an elderly rhinoceros, on which they seized, and, all four mounting on his back, the quangle-wangle sitting on his horn and holding on by his ears, and the pussycat swinging at the end of his tail, they set off, having only four small beans and three pounds of mashed potatoes to last through the whole journey. They were, however, able to catch a number of the chickens and turkeys and other birds, who incessantly alighted on the head of the rhinoceros for the purpose of gathering the seeds of the rhododendron plants which grew there. And these creatures they cooked in the most translucent and satisfactory manner, by means of a fire lighted on the end of the rhinoceros's back. A crowd of kangaroos and gigantic cranes accompanied them, from feelings of curiosity and complacency, so they were never at a loss for company, and went onward as it were, in a sort of profuse and triumphant procession. Thus, in less than eighteen weeks, they all arrived safely at home, where they were received by their admiring relatives with joy tempered with contempt, and where they finally resolved to carry out the rest of their travelling plans at some more favourable opportunity. As for the rhinoceros, in token of their grateful adherence, they had him killed and stuffed directly, and then set him up outside the door of their father's house, as a diaphanous door scraper. End of the story of the four little children who went round the world.